welcome to our conversation. So um, we've been we've been talking a lot about you in your absence. <laughs> and should pay can you tell us uh, can you tell us a bit more uh what should pay is sure so um should pay is um a third party well uh, at its inception a digital escrow provider and pay secure payments company but we've um since 2017 2018 when we met with the sra in the early early stages of their development of the third party managed account principles and the draft rules uh, we met with them at that stage and started exploring whether or not um, we could adapt our technology or what we were de developing at the time to suit those needs and at least um, take into account the expected outcomes that the SRA had in, um, in a solution that we were to provide to the legal market. My background is as a lawyer, so I was uh, familiar with the, uh, the pains of, um, of dealing with client accounts um, or, or, or the process of funds. Um, and um and yeah and so out of that was born our, our third panic managed account solution we uh got an innovate uk grant funding which was um which was great the day in 2018 we then um developed particularly around the use case of property transactions which is where i think you know the biggest pain around holding funds is or the biggest risk is um and really we've gone from there so we we're now at about 70 plus law firms um bearing in mind that the rule changes only came in in november um we've you know we're, we're feeling feeling pretty good that pe that there's a, a larger adoption of, of this as a process but in its core shield pay basically provides kyc and aml services onboarding all the payers and payees in a transaction and um facilitates and holds the funds in segregated safeguarded client accounts uh, with a tier one bank and in this case either barclays or santander, uh, santander lloyd's or ClearBank, we have accounts with all of them. Um, and there um, we prefer to reconcile and provide messaging to all parties in a transaction. So you as your client, you will ask them for fees on account or the deposit. Um, the moment they go through an onboarding process with ShieldPay, pay either by card, um, bank transfer, or in due course open banking. And then um, uh, once we receive the funds, we provide notifications to everyone that everything's happened. Um, and then through digital authorizations, funds are then released um, in accordance with um, overarching documentation or the conditions of the deal. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, Jay, Emma, can you tell us a bit more about the relationship with which you pay, how things have progressed from your side? We heard a bit from Jeff uh, here. Um, uh, you know, can you can you tell us a bit more uh, how things progressed over the years? Um, yeah, hello, Jeff. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's been really good in the sense that um, not just with Jeff. So, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of time for Jeff in, this, in the sense that Jeff will come to us and say, Jatinda, I'm not sure about X, Y and Z. And this conversation didn't start on the 25th of November last year. This conversation started many, many years before that. Um, and it was because there was this concept and some people seem to forget that it wasn't us that started the, the, the conversations about law firms and their ability to hold client money um, or solicitors or lawyers holding client money. This started off by some research that was done by the Legal Services Board. Um, when you look at sort of the risks associated with um, lawyers holding client money some people say oh it's an intrinsic part to to how I practice that it gives clients the confidence that you know that I'm doing everything that I need to do for them and that that's all fine but then you have the cynic in in me that says okay if that's if that's all good then there wouldn't be the need for something like the SRA's compensation fund that pays out millions of pounds for um money that has been lost due to the the acts of dishonest solicitors or people working mm -hmm. within within law firms and it's it's really hard to sort of say that you know to say that because sometimes then you get you know shouted at and people say that you know you're tarnishing every solicitor with the same brush but it's those stories that should we say make the daily mail that you know that yeah Chitinder Law ran off with you know all the pro, all probate money so it's those sort of stories that get picked up and it was on the back of that the legal services board did some research to think about okay do solicitors and lawyers generally in, in England and Wales need to be holding client money themselves in their, within their practice? Um, and, and they came up with alternatives and they were looking at other jurisdictions as well. So they looked at Germany, France, you know, some other, you know, the States, 
some of the um, the different state bars in the USA, they they have alternative arrangements as well. So it was on the back of that that we had the approach from from ShieldPay to say, okay, this is a product that we're looking to develop. What do you think that we need to be doing in terms of making sure that clients understand that this isn't a client account as is traditionally sought, but how do we make sure that there's proper protection around the product that we're developing? Um, so we, we issued guidance back in December 2017 to say that, yeah, if you were thinking about using a TPMA as a law firm, um, the certain things that we want you to think about. So it was making sure that the client understood the, the basis of which um, the agreement that you'd entered into with a TPMA provider, um, how the how the transactions would be facilitated, um, but more importantly, that you know, making sure that people understood that the TPMA provider themselves were regulated as well. So this was something really important to us. We work very closely with the the Financial Conduct Authority to look at okay, who do we want to have as TPMA providers? And they said okay, from their rules. Um, when you look at the the regulation that applies around money remittance and authorized payments, it has to be you know either a authorized payment institute or those that are exempt for whatever reason. So that's when Jeff came up and said, look, you know we are authorized by the FCA. This is what we've got in terms of our risk, and this is how we manage it. We're compliant, and we do everything that we need to do. And this is the model that we're thinking of developing. And um, some of the early discussions and. Jeff will sort of support me here as well, was trying to get people to understand that the TPA model was slightly different to traditional escrow accounts that law firms were used to be working with. That, you know, they think that, oh, okay, it's an escrow account, you know, that's fine. And then there was the sort of worry around, okay, what does it actually mean? The TPMA solution is slightly different to escrow facilities because what it does, which is the most important thing for me, I think it provides the consumer or the client with clarity in terms of how the money's being moved from A to B. And during that process, I will be notified by Jeff as the TPMA provider to say, yeah, Jatinda, um, guys thinking about moving 300,000 pounds, can you, you know, this is coming up now as, as a notification in the next three days. I have the right to rebut that that movement of money. So as a client, I've got control. And this is really important that sometimes you don't see that control in law firms um, because it's all done behind the scenes. So I'm not actually given a, a notification when my solicitor in a traditional law firm would be thinking about moving money. You know, sometimes it's after the event, they'll send me a message to, oh yeah, we've moved money for you. Or if we're dealing with a dishonest solicitor, you know, they won't even tell me then. It'll be after, you know, when I'm looking around to see where it's all gone. The TPMA solution is, like I said, slightly different. And that's where, when we had that interaction with Jeff, it was to make sure that the product that we're developing was that, one, law firms understood what it meant for them and how they then explained the whole logistics behind it to, to their clients and what it actually meant in terms of protections as well. So, yeah, it's been, been good. Um, I yeah. think we've learned, learned a lot along the way from each yeah. other as well. I, I think the, the gen, there's a general principle there in relation to, to the, 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 the SRA are, are there to, 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 to engage with innovators and the providers of, of tech solutions. We, we, we can never endorse particular products, but we're there to explain our requirements, to explain our rules, to explain how we do things. So innovators can, can you know, develop solutions that, 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 that solicitors can be confident that they can use and still be compliant with our rules. And, and, and I think that's, you know, that has been very much felt by by us um, in in this in these engagements. Um, by no means have you give it. You know the one of the things that that you often you are often asked as the SRA, I'm sure, to endorse people. But I think the main right. point is that a law firm, but you'll never will, and understandably so. But but the main point is that a law firm needs to look at all of these solutions they look into as part of the risk management and their own due yeah. diligence for their own practice. So if they choose to expose their clients to the use of a particular process or particular third party provider for whatever it may be, they need to be do the due care and con, due care and, and consideration of what that product is. Um, one of the main aspects on the great thing about third party managed accounts for some citizens it removes the um the or the, the, the adherence or the need to adhere to the accounts rules to a certain extent. But what it doesn't do, and that's the same to any use of any third party solution, is remove the code of conduct obligations that a right. solicitor would have exactly. um, overarching either practice or as an individual. And so it's very important when when you know when we speak to people, we say yes, you, you no longer are required to uh, follow the uh, the um, 
the client account rules as such because it's not client money. Um, but what you are, you still need to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do. And that's one of the one of the main things. You're still responsible and <coughs> duties in that respect. So there's a shift of liabilities, but not all of it. But that, you know, that's and you know that that due diligence requires you to check that that company that you're dealing with is going to remain solvent, that that company is going to be has got the right security protocols in place. Um, you know, all of those matters that um, that you know are part of your your risk management. Yeah. That you do. Yeah. We were talking about security, Jeff, earlier. I mean, from your perspective as an innovator, do, do, you, do, you, do you sincerely believe that standard uh, law firm and a freelancer can provide the same level of security? I, I think with the right tools, um, a freelancer can be as secure, if not more secure, than someone without, a, a larger firm without those tools. Um, mm -hmm. The age-old model between the top end of the firms that have all of the resources in the world to create security protocols and 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 have IT departments and etc. Yet they still fall victim of data breaches um, because they've had loopholes or they have legacy systems. Whilst you can have a freelance solicitor who uses you know systems that are like guys or ours or any number of systems combined and be as resilient, if not more resilient, to attacks than um, a small or larger law firm. Um, because they've removed all of those external risks. The, the majority of the risks, security risks, are not necessarily in the systems, they're in the number of inefficient processes that exist within a firm. Yeah, that, that's actually kind of, I was trying to explain to someone yesterday that, you know, when they say, can, how secure is your system? Can you hack into the system? It's not, it's not a case of security in terms of uh, hacking. It's, a, it's the fact that someone gets an email which says, here's a link, please go ahead and pay this invoice. And sometimes that email comes on a Friday and they can't check it until the following Monday. So, you know, what and a traditional lawyer, you know, has to sort of uh, think about what's best to do and then and then go ahead and do it. But with a product like ShieldPay, you know, at least in my experience, um, ShieldPay is taking the extra steps of making sure that the payee is who they say they are, the payer is who they say they are, um, and, you know, sending SMSs and... and making it basically less risky for a solicitor to, to send money around. You know, and it's something that I realized recently about, about the legal profession is lawyers basically have two functions. They're supposed to give you legal advice and then they're supposed to hold money on your behalf and remit it in certain instances. And so, you know, third party managed accounts just give them the ability to, to do that, you know, have very powerful um, tools at their hands, but uh, in a very secure and, and safe way. That's what I like about the Shield Pay product and you know the third party managed account concept. It it, it, it it really makes me it really makes me feel hopeful that you know there there seem to be very successful uh, essentially guidance on the side of the SRA how innovators can actually work. I think that there is a common misperception that a lot of the regulatory uh, authorities, regardless of uh, which uh, particular industry vertical it is, are, are completely uncooperative with innovators, which is clearly not uh, the case. Um, and, 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 the fact that, and the fact that people are actually able to provide that clear guidance is, is really what makes products good and compliant and, and what uh, allows people to essentially you know, move forward with the way that they practice practice law. Um, I've got uh, I've got one question for you, Jatinder. Um, are clients of freelancers able to access the SRA's uh, compensation fund? Uh, I believe you may be muted. <laughs> Sorry. That's there all right. I think that's a really, really important question because this was something that we that we were thinking about as we were developing the different models of how solicitors could practice and who's the compensation fund available to. Um, and it's like I said that you know it's always the the sort of the the worst case scenarios that we end up with when we're looking at the compensation fund because it is when clients have lost money. So it's about making sure okay if we've put a control on someone that they're not allowed to hold any client money then. What does that actually mean? Yeah, they're not allowed to hold any client money, but does it mean that they should still have access to the compensation fund? And I think this is where, you know, the lawyers in the room that are listening in will, will realize that, okay, yeah, there are certain circumstances that even if I'm not operating a client account as a freelancer or even as a, you know, a, a, a solicitor in a traditional law firm setup, that I might still be 
um, able to access a client's money. So where I've been appointed as deputy or where I've been appointed as um, a trustee or where I've been appointed through a power of attorney that I will have access to Jatinda Loyal's personal HSBC account. And we, we've seen so many stories where that money has actually been dishonestly used so it hasn't even reached the law firm's client account it hasn't even reached you know jeff's tpma solution it's still sitting in the the client's personal bank account but because yeah jeff or emma have got that power of attorney or they're they're acting as deputy through court protection they've got access to my personal bank account so it's important to realize that yeah that where what we confirmed was that through the the protections that if a solicitor was practicing on their own so this is where the the rules the compensation funds rules really set out in terms of who the protections apply to so it's any solicitor that's practicing on their own um doesn't have employees and they've engaged directly with the, the client as well. So you could have a situation that, you know, even a client of a freelancer doing unreserved work that was engaged directly with that individual, not through a service company, would have access to the compensation fund. And the same for the, the solicitor that was doing reserve work, their clients would have access to the compensation fund as well. It's really important protection um, because, yeah, there, there are many circumstances. Like I said, we can come up with so many different scenarios where people think, oh, I'm not holding client money, so why? You know, freelancers sometimes ask the question, why do I need to contribute to the compensation fund? It's because of those reasons that you still have access to a client's money. The client's money doesn't have to be, be sitting in the a client account or a TPMA for it to be misused. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jatinder. Um, Jeff, can you tell us? I mean, you know, with, with any innovation, it's always working in progress. You know, there, there, there is no end to, to improvement. Um, you know, what are the improvements coming up for 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 customers, and and how are they aligning with the with the regulations that are introduced by the SRA? Um, that's a, a wonderful question because it tees me up perfectly. But uh, the the one of the you know I think there's a lot of discussion around what uh, the principle of assured assured identity might be, or um, KYC and AML, and whether or not. The fifth money laundering directive, whether or not people, regulated entities, can actually start um, actually placing reliance and really relying on one another's uh, KYC and AML. That's something that we're very, very keen to be a part of the solution to. One of the um, elements that we undertake, we will always do money laundering checks and KYC on every client and every AE, every person that pays us will be paid. But um, what we what we will be extending is rather than what we now provide with a is verified or is not verified by ShieldPay. We're looking to provide a lot more of the wealth of the data that we've gathered to make that decision and give that to our clients. Um, but that is a product development that will come. Um, and one of our, I guess I'll be the, the standout one in due course, but it's um, it's a little way off yet, but um, that's the exciting one to come. Fantastic. So without further ado, I'm gonna put forward a few questions from our audience. I promise only the nice ones. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, we've got a question from Derek Coco. Could not a client fetter an undertaking? Who wish to take that question? Jay, it, it... Um, I'm not sure I understand the undertake yeah. uh, the question as such because. Mm. Um, the undertakings. Derek, normally, could you clarify, please? Um, yeah. the questions are normally, you know, undertakings are normally given on behalf of the client to, you know, somebody else in the, the transactions to the other, the other party in the transaction. So it could be a solicitor or somebody else. Um, and it's always, you know, nine times out of ten, um, all professional undertakings that I've seen will be given for the benefit of the client. Um, so in conveyancing transactions, we always see, you know. Um, I undertake to discharge mortgages on receipt of completion monies that, you know, that that's on behalf of the client that's selling the property, that they want to make sure that there's nothing coming to them afterwards in terms of um, unpaid mortgages. But the person that's buying the house as well, they want to have title that's free of any charges that might have existed. Um, so I'm not sure how the client could. If it, if a client did think that they could fetter an undertaking that had been given by a, by a law firm, then... There's questions around whether the solicitor was acting independently um, and more importantly that, you know, were they doing anything that could potentially take an unfair advantage of anybody else in the transaction as well. So I think independence is really important, which is why it stayed as a, a professional principle um, in the new standards and regulations that solicitors always need to act independently. 
we, we do we do have a, cl a slight clarification here from Derek. Uh, what he meant is uh, in terms of the use of third party account needing universal approval. So, so I, I, know. I, I I'm probably well placed to, to kind of the, the button on that. But the, um, the 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 principle is that a third party managed account can either be a project account where multiple parts all parties are involved but generally speaking they are used by one law firm and so your the 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 undertakings you wouldn't the, the undertakings that people will provide are only to the extent that um i undertake to uh to instruct um the third party managed account provider to execute the payments much like currently a solicitor's undertaking ought to contain wording that um, I will or I will be instructing my bank to make the payment, and that is to the extent of their responsibility. Um, in in the case of whether or not it requires the uh, uh, the whether a, a client could over overstep that, then that's absolutely in your in the in the process that you need to um, you know need that's that's down to the law firm to figure out in their own practice and in their own process with 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 their clients. Um, and and. and I I'm very happy to take that, um, Derek, um, separately if you would like. By all means, I'll, I'll be more than happy to to connect you uh, after the webinar as well. Um, one one over to you, Guy. Why do you feel a potential client would uh, use a freelancer rather than a traditional firm? That's a question from Linda Burke. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice question, and it's something I, I chat to freelancers about uh, quite a bit. Um, I think that you know traditionally law firms have have obviously held some sort of advantage in terms of reputation, and you know if you go to a big firm, uh, you're going to get a certain level of service. Um, but all solicitors actually have a a brand, and very often it's a brand that they build up over many years. Very often uh, solicitors come via a referral from uh, from someone who's used them in the past. Uh, like I alluded to earlier on, very often a solicitor gets a referral from another solicitor. I think the Clio um, survey that was done last year said that something in the range of 77% of, of everyone who finds their way to a solicitor actually comes through a referral, be it from a, a client or another lawyer, um, as opposed to sort of doing a Google search uh, as you would with many of the other professions. So I think that a lot of it uh, really does come down to to your reputation, to the work you've done in the past, um, and and that's something that uh, that is not the purview specifically of a law firm. It, it very often is uh, the case that the solicitor is the person who who attracts the work, uh, which is one of the reasons why partners get paid more money at big firms if they bring in more work, um, and it also speaks to the way in which uh, solicitors who who have a good brand and who you know, get out there and, and do good work and build networks uh, can really take advantage of, of those networks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, I th we're over time now. Uh, Jatinder, Emma, Jeff, Guy, it's been an honor and a pleasure to spend this afternoon wow. with you. <laughs> Thanks so much thank for you. setting it thank up. Thank you. Thank, thank you very I much for everyone that joined. The people that were listening. <laughs> And I wish everyone a fantastic bank holiday. I'm sure you all have big plans for the coming weekend. Yeah, we Making do. homemade yeah. pizza. Stay yeah. safe. Thanks, anyway, just to everybody listening as well, can they? We just want to sort of plug that there is there is guidance on our website, and I think some of the questions that might have come through is again where people have. I'm not saying that you should you need to read our guidance first, but we have developed a whole range of guidance and it's really important to understand one of the, the key things to I think pick up on is the guidance that we publish or a page where we've said different ways of working and that sets out you know solicitors in traditional law firms to freelancers working on their own um, to solicitors working in-house to solicitors setting up their own companies and providing on reserve legal services so that I think people just need to start thinking about okay what resource have the SRA provided but yeah um, if people do want to ask yeah any questions of us I'm sure Emma and I will be happy to to speak to people and connect. of course we would, of course we um, would. yeah we're not doing face-to-face yeah. -face meetings so <laughs> I can attest to the I can attest to the fact that they answer their emails even on weekends yeah. <laughs> but don't get okay. used to that please thank yeah. you guys <laughs>